first lesson is from the book of Genesis, third chapter, verses 1 through 24. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from my tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, a knowing of good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took one of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the fruit of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you among all the animals and among all the wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat until the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree, about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth, forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherub, and a sword flaming and turning to guard away the tree of life. Here is the reading. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O God, strength of the powerless and light of all darkness, look in mercy upon your church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, that it may be an ark of peace in the midst of chaos. Let the whole world experience and see that what was fallen is being raised up, that which was old is being made new, and that all things are being restored to wholeness through him, for whom they first took their being. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We all have the second reading for tonight.
lesson for tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 22. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, to through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Simon Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, the brother of Jesus, then to all of the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, Paul. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. And on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation of the gospel has been in vain, and your faith has also been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. But in fact, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. There ends the reading for tonight. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> will the congregation please rise? The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray the prayer of the day. O oh God, you gave your only Son, who suffered death on the cross for our redemption. By his glorious resurrection, you deliver us from the power of death. Make us die every day to sin, so that we may live with him forever in the joy of our own resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Will the congregation please be seated for the reading of tonight's Gospel lesson. The Easter Gospel for tonight is taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. You can follow along on your bulletin insert. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran... And she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, John, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away our Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two of them were running together. 
But the other disciple, John, outran, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. There he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up and placed by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, that's John, also went in, and he saw, and he believed. For yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. Well, Mary Magdalene stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. Well, the angel said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And Mary Magdalene said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Then Mary Magdalene said this. She turned around, and then she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener. Mary Magdalene said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him that I might take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned. And she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus then said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended into the Father. But go to my brothers, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Well, Mary Magdalene went, and she announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on this Easter Vigil service, we thank you for the opportunity to, to come to St. Paul's Wurttemberg tonight and to sit back and to reflect and to think about the meaning of the resurrection. Lord, open our hearts and minds and help us to understand this important doctrine, the central focus of the Christian religion. Help us to understand this, to have a deeper faith in you during this all-important Easter day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, now, this is a really important sermon, and I can't do something like this on Easter Sunday morning because I haven't seen these people since Christmas, and they don't know what I'm going to be talking about. But you come all the time. You are seasoned veterans of my ranting and raving. So I'm going to give you a fat, juicy steak. I'd say, I'd say it could be like a prime rib, maybe a three or four pounder, and you're going to get it right on your lap tonight. So be ready. Okay, everybody ready? Okay, now, you probably don't know this or not, but the first sermon I ever preached, I was maybe 23 years old. I was going to a Southern Baptist church, and the elders came up to me, and they said, the minister Ed here now, can you mind preaching a sermon for us? I said, uh, uh, yeah, I guess I'll try to do that. So the text that I chose was 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yeah, the text that Vani read. So for me, this is like, I've been like wrestling with this since I was 23 years old at least, right? Now, this is a really important text. And Vani, you didn't read all the little notes that I wrote on here, unfortunately. But fortunately, I'm here to interpret my handwriting to you. Here we go. What, what, Vani, let me ask you, what, uh, what book is this again? First Corinthians. That means there's a second Corinthians, isn't there? Who wrote it? What's the name of our church? Paul. St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Wurttemberg. We can never know too much about Paul. Now, skeptics, cynics, people who don't believe in anything, they're scholars, they study the Bible like a literary document. They don't care about God or Jesus or anything. They don't really like Matthew, Mark, and Luke because it's, you know, and then John. They don't like that. But they do like Paul. Why do they like Paul? Paul is written, he was active prior to the writing of the four Gospels. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we think was written around 50 A.D. Stop. What date do we use for the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? 33, 33 A.D. 
So what is that? Oh, it's about 25 years later, Paul is writing a letter to Corinth, the Corinthians, okay? Now, the church in Corinth is all messed up. They have all kinds of problems. So he lets them have it with both barrels. Vani, you had the right attitude when you read this tonight, but you're not quite as good as Ro Ro Roxanne Becker. She has unresolved issues. So when she reads Paul, it's like you feel like you're being yelled at by someone who's really suffered, right? So, so this is what Paul, when you read Paul, it's it meant to be shouted in your face, right? So he's trying to tell these people, look, I was there, I taught you the right thing, and now I'm gone, and look what you're doing, you believe in all kinds of wacky, weird stuff, you need to get back to basics again. Now, in the middle of this, he's, he says, I'm reminding you about the gospel. Stop. What is the gospel? DBR. DBR, which is what? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. Why do you have to say that? Why do I say that all the time? The gospel is not saying, I like the good and, the, the good and noble Jesus, the teacher. I'm going to give out uh, like uh, free stuff to people. That's the gospel. No, it isn't. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Stop. What's the shorthand that I teach you? Right? Five fingers. George, you know this. B, birth of Christ. L, life of Christ. D, death of Christ. R, resurrection of Christ. A, ascension of Christ. Now, you can boil it down to DDR, like the German Democratic Republic, DDR, okay? D is the deity of Christ. Deity of Christ. The second D is the death of Christ. R is the resurrection of Christ. So tonight we're talking about DDR, right? So here we go. That's the gospel. So Paul says, look, I proclaim to you the gospel, right? And where did he get this from? He received it from somewhere. Now, 33 AD, what's that again? Death by resurrection of Christ. Paul, we think, was converted to Christianity on the road to Damascus when? Around 36 AD. Then, within a couple of years, he goes back to Jerusalem and he meets with who? He meets with Peter and with James, the brother of Jesus, and, and Paul. The three of them are together. And there, they spent a couple of weeks together according to the New Testament text. What do you think they talked about? Here's what they talked about. Jesus. Can you believe the Buffalo Bills are going to get a new stadium? <laughs> $1.5 billion for a boondoggle. You know, these politicians, the New York State budget is horrible. You know, what are we going to do about Biden? What are we going to do about Trump? No, that's not what they talked about. Here's what they talked about. The tradition. The story. They talked about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, there's a little, a little tidbit in here. We know from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave the... That's in 1 Corinthians 11 in 50 AD. Where does Paul get that from? That is a little liturgical formula that they were using in the early church. One from, one from where? Oh, maybe 39, 40 AD. Is that old? That's within like seven, eight, nine years of the death, the actual historical events. Here we have another little creed, an ancient creed. Do we know the Apostles' Creed? Do we know the Nicene Creed? Do we know the Athanasian Creed? You know the Athanasian Creed. Well, in those creeds, what's the purpose of a creed? Illiterate people in the ancient world, maybe 98% of the people are illiterate. So how do you teach illiterate people things? By room. Yeah, you, or you make them memorize things, and you do repetition. You say it over and over and over again until they learn. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? In the night in which he was betrayed, all of it, that is a liturgical creed that people memorized. It has a rhythm to it. And this, in the middle of this 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul's talking about the resurrection, he says it's a creed. Who, what is this? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That is a little mini creed. It's like the core of the Apostles' Creed that's already 150 AD. So early Christians, when? 39 and 40 AD. When they got together, what were they talking about? They were talking about 
What? They were talking about the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ on the third day. What is this in accordance with the scriptures? Why does it repeat that twice? Because the resurrection of Christ is not something that, oh, it just happened one day, Jesus decided he was tired of being dead, he walked out of the tomb. No, it is a fulfillment of what? The 333 Messianic prophecies. Steve, did you read anything tonight? Yes, I did. What did you read? I read Genesis. Did you read Genesis 3.15? I read Genesis. Yes, you did. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the servant. That's the first Messianic prophecy. And the Old Testament is packed 333 prophecies. So in accordance with the scriptures, yeah, specifically it's Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. And he's, in, he's raised again on the third day. What is that? That's Jonah specifically. He's how many days in the belly of the whale? Three. Three, Three days. days in the belly of the whale. Okay? So we have... Uh, we have, he dies for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, substitutionary atonement, and he's buried, right? That's a place, tomb, place, and the time is on the third day. It's time and space continuum, okay? Time and space continuum. Now, that's the core. Then he goes on in this, in his uh, first Corinthians 15, he says, well, there are 12 post-resurrection appearances recorded by Jesus between Easter Sunday and Ascension Day. The A, Ascension, okay? Mm -hmm. So he appears, they're recorded now, 12 of them, okay? And one of them is that he appears to Simon Peter, he appears to Mary Magdalene in tonight's Gospel lesson, right? Then he appears to more, to more than 500 brothers and sisters. Then he appears to James, the brother of Jesus. Stop. I feel compelled to do a three-hour lecture on James, so I'm going to do it tonight. Lock the doors. <laughs> Who is James? The brother of Jesus. You see, Mark, Joseph and Mary, right? We believe in the Virgin Mary, the virgin birth of Christ. But guess what? Joseph and Mary are normal married people, and they had other children, mm -hmm. boys and girls, right? We don't know the girls' names, but we know the boys' names. And one of the sons is James. What did Jesus' family think of him? during his three and a half year earthly ministry. Come on. They thought he was schizophrenic. The Greek word schizo, wacko, out of his mind, right? And they were gonna take him away. His brothers and sisters are outside with his mother and they're gonna take him away because he's embarrassing the family. Did James believe in Jesus during Jesus' lifetime? I don't think so. Only after the risen Lord appeared to James did he believe. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? That's sad. Well, and James goes on to become the leader of the church of Jerusalem and so on. But the idea is, does God use perfect people to be their missionaries, their ministers? Their... No, God uses flawed and broken people. Mm -hmm. I think James probably spent the rest of his life regretting the fact that he missed it. His own brother, he missed it. Right? And how about, how about Paul? Is he a perfect person? He's perfect in every way, isn't he? St. Paul? No, what does he do? He's a hunter of Christians. He gets papers to go to, Jeru to Damascus and hunt down Christians and kill them. He's like Heinrich Himmler. Imagine that. Heinrich Himmler's coming to town. Let's have, I'll get all the Jews together. We'll have a celebration to welcome him in. That's Paul, Saul, right? And on the road, he's converted to Christianity. Well, how about Peter, the other one here? Jesus appeared to Simon Peter. He was perfect in every way, wasn't he? He denied how many times? Three times. Three times he denies Jesus. In the time when Jesus needed him the most, he said, I don't even know who he is. No, 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 I don't know, no, no. They all ran away. And he was at the, heart, he was at the head of the group running away. So guess what? The risen Lord appears to Peter. He appears to James, he appears to Paul, who's writing 1 Corinthians, and he appears to 500 people, and so on, and so on. Okay, now, is this sort of an important thing? Yeah, because this is Easter Sunday. What is Easter Sunday about? I went to Walmart with Mrs. Isaacs last week, and I'm trying to find a Paschal lamb for the piece of the Paschal lamb. You know, they don't have no, no such thing. Instead, they have the Easter unicorn. The true meaning of Easter is the Easter unicorn. 
And they have the Easter bunnies, they have the Easter unicorn. It's anything and everything but Jesus walking out of the tomb. Isn't that interesting? You know, I go to Tops today and there's like a, a, an energy, a frenzy. Everybody's buying and buying and buying. But they can't wait to have Easter, which is kind of like a spring Christmas for these people. But they say happy holidays or Merry Christmas or happy Easter. Well, they don't know what they're even talking about, right? Say, like, oh, I see you believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ then, don't you? Right. Isn't that interesting? Like they missed the whole point of the, of the holiday, right? So, so the DBR is the core and the center of what Easter is all about. That's why we're here tonight. That's why tomorrow morning we have Easter, Easter Sunday service here at 10. Death, burial, resurrection of Christ. It's extremely important. Now what's going to happen? You're going to have a family get together tomorrow. I know I am. And what's going to happen? There's always going to be somebody there. Genius there. And they're, they're like atheist or something, right? You, know, you can't help it, you're related to them. So they're there, right? They come to your house on Easter, but they, they have to make sure that they make a point to argue with you about the Christian religion because they don't believe that stuff. Because they're, more, they're scientific or something, right? So what do you do about this? Mostly you just sort of bite your tongue, maybe go for another beer or something, or you just punch them in the face. That's what you do, right? Right? So, but what do you do with this? Well, here's what you're going to hear tomorrow around your table, okay? You probably won't hear this because it's too sophisticated, but they just basically, they don't, they don't want to believe in general, okay? They're going to say something like this. I can't believe you believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. First of all, they're going to start by saying something like, there's no such person as Jesus never lived. Is that, is that a, can you say that with any kind of a straight face? No. The answer is no. All right, why is that? I have this book over here. This is one of my favorite books. This is The Story of Civilization, Civilization by Will Durant. And it's called Caesar and, what? Christ. Christ. Caesar and Christ. Who's Will Durant? Well, he, he studied with the Jesuits when he was a young boy in school. And he became like a communist when he was like 19 or 20 years old. He read about 8,000 books. And then he wrote this 11 volume set called The Story of Civilization. As he got older in life, he became kind of a, kind of a centrist, you know, liberal or something, a Democrat, you know. But in this book, right, it would have been a great opportunity for the historian Will Durant to say, I'm going to take half of this book and throw it away because Jesus never existed. No, there is a historical Jesus and you have to deal with it whether you like it or not. I don't like it, it hurts my feelings because it shatters all my opinions. Well, there is a historical Jesus. So, for, so he, did he live? Yeah, he lived. Why? The birth of Christ, the life of Christ, right? This is called the, the, uh, the, 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 the doctrine of Christ. Who is Jesus? 100% man and 100% God. It's called the hypostatic union. Is Jesus born? Yes. Born of the Virgin Mary, right? Suffering from Pontius Pilate. Okay, so he's really born. When does he live? Circa 7 BC to 33 AD. We know the place that he lived. We can, you can visit these sites. Now, um, what do you do about the deity of Christ? 100% God? Well, guess what? You're going to have to wait for a minute to see what we do about that D. Okay? So let's do the death of Christ. There are, there are five theories that you're going to hear from people, okay? The first one, let's do, the women went to the wrong tomb. Okay, this is a, a common theory that people will say. Now, you heard tonight's gospel lesson, and if you were in church last night, you heard the, you heard the crucifixion story told from the gospel of St. Luke. What's the big deal about the women? What did the women do when they, Jesus was on the cross, right? What happened? Joseph and Mary Mathia takes him down off the cross, along with Nicodemus, and they watch as he, Joseph and Mary Mathia, takes and places him in a new tomb, right? The women watched, right? That was Friday night. Sunday morning at dawn, as the sun is coming up, they go to that same tomb, okay? They go to the same tomb. Was it the wrong tomb? Saw if you read the gospel lessons, they stress over and over again, the women watched, the women watched, Joseph of Arimathea, right? Everyone watched the tomb. So the idea of going to the wrong tomb. And tonight's gospel lesson, did you listen? No, right? What happened when um, 
John and Peter ran to the tomb. Who got there first? John got there first, and then what? Did, then who went in first? Peter went in. What did they see when they saw the place where the body of Jesus was laid? The linen. It's it's an empty tomb, empty slab, right? And what else did they see? The linen and the the scarves. Yeah. Okay. So they saw bloody rags laying there, and the thing that they had over Jesus' face, like a a, a napkin, it was curled, laid laid out there. Now, if they went to the wrong tomb, whose bloody linen and the face wrapping would that have been? In other words, that, that, that's, that's an internal evidence that they went to the right tomb, and instead of finding the dead body of Jesus, they find it empty, and what else do they find there? You didn't listen to the story? Angels? Yeah, how many angels? Two, two. two witnesses. Right, Deuteronomy 17, 1, you have to have two witnesses to convict somebody. So you have two witnesses, men in dazzling white clothes, sort of like the Ark of the Covenant mm. with the two cherubs facing in. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? What's in the Ark of the Covenant, George? You know this, the Ten Commandments, the rod of Aaron that budded, and a pot of manna. And the mercy seat is the top of the Ark of the Covenant. That's where the blood of the Lamb is spilled to cover the sins of the people. The new Ark of the Covenant. Where's the Ark of the Covenant? I know, it's in, the, it's in a government warehouse somewhere because you watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. No, we don't need the Ark of the Covenant anymore because we have a new Ark of the Covenant. The empty tomb of Jesus and the two angels, interpreting angels, tell us what it means. He is not here, he is risen. Okay? Extremely important. Did they go to the wrong tomb? No. That's... If you don't read the text, then you maybe you can believe they went to the wrong tomb. But there's like multiple proofs in the text itself that they went to the correct tomb. Okay? Um, let's do the next one then. The reason that the tomb was empty is because his body was stolen. All right, now, this is a good one. Who stole the body? Let's start at the list of usual suspects here. Number one, the gardener stole the body. This is the real theory. People actually say that the gardener stole the body. Now, in the story that I just read tonight, that's the only reference of a gardener in, in, the, in the Gospels. Okay? Yeah. Who's the gardener in tonight's text? Jesus. 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 Mary Magdalene thought that the gardener mm -hmm. was the gardener, but no, it was really Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the gardener, you can't say a non-existent character is the one who stole the body. But wait, there's more. I know who stole the body. The disciples stole the body. This was an early way of trying to explain the empty tomb. The Jewish authorities were embarrassed because the body was gone. So rather than saying Jesus never existed or they went to the wrong tomb, they said the disciples stole the body. Stop. You know about these disciples. Mm -hmm. Are they capable of a high-level conspiracy where they get together and they go, okay, I'm gonna put black stuff on my face. I'm gonna crawl on my stomach. We're gonna to go, to to go to the place where the tomb is. Um, we're sure we have the right tomb too because the women told us where it was. And we're gonna get like ropes and we're gonna climb down the side of the cliff and then when the Roman guard is there, how many people on a Roman guard, six of them? Are they tough dudes? Um, try to think of Navy SEALs <laughs> or try to think of like Green Berets or something. Scourge. These are tough dudes. Scourge. Are you going to, and who are you? You're a fisherman. Yeah. Are you trained in how to use weapons? Mm -mm. Can you yeah. cut a man's throat? Oh, are you yeah. willing to beat up a Roman soldier, overpower them, kick them out of the way, roll over a stone that weighs a ton and a half, Get that out of the way. Take the dead body of Jesus and drag it off into obscurity. Are you going to do that? Where were the apostles anyway? They were hiding in the upper room with the doors locked and the shades down. And they were like this. Ah, oh no, oh no. They, they killed Jesus. They're going to kill us next. Because that's what the Romans do, you know. Yeah. Not only did they take out the leader of the gang, they wipe out the whole gang. Yeah. And they're merciless. So the disciples, they... They were right not to show their face in public because they would have been denounced and they would have been the next people crucified. 
Are these people capable of a high-level conspiracy? And here's the kicker. Ready for this? What happened to Peter? See, this is Jesus being crucified. Peter is crucified upside down. He says, I am not worthy to die like my Lord. How about the Apostle Paul? He was beheaded, had his head chopped off because he's a Roman citizen. All of the apostles, except for John, the beloved disciple, he ended up in exile at Patmos, the island of Patmos, the book of Revelation. What's worse, to be killed outright or to be sent into exile? Exile. To be sent into exile in a rock pile, uh, basically you starve to death on the rock pile. All of them died as martyrs. Now, what did they say? Just as they're nailing Peter on the cross to hang it upside down, here's what he said. Ha ah, ha, we made it all up. We stole the body. Really? Uh, we were just kidding. Ha ah, ha When we say death, burial, resurrection, we didn't really mean that. None of them ever recanted. Do you think if Peter or Paul would have recanted and said, we made it all up, it's a stinking lie? that maybe the enemies of Christ and Christianity would want to broadcast that, mm -hmm. you would never hear the end of it. But yet, there's no record of that. Instead, in the first three centuries of Christianity, three and a half million people were martyred. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The more they killed us, the more we insisted on the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, the gospel, the more they killed us. And they killed us. And they killed, until finally the Roman soldiers with blood dripping off of their swords said, you know what? These people don't even flinch when we kill them. Would I be willing to die for Jupiter? Or for Apollo? No. Maybe there's something to this Christianity. The Roman soldiers began to convert to Christianity because of the witness and testimony of the martyrs. The disciples stole the body. What a ridiculous thing. But wait, there might, there might be some other suspects. Maybe Pontius Pilate stole the body. Or maybe the Jewish religious leaders in the temple stole the body. Or maybe Herod Antipas, the maniac who killed John the Baptist, maybe he stole the body. Here's what you do. Who wants to refute the Christian religion? Your relative who's going to be eating with you tomorrow would probably want to, okay, here, here's what you do. Produce the dead body of Jesus. Put him on display. Hang him up there on the wall so we can all look at it and realize, oh yeah, he's really dead. He's not coming back, right? Dead men don't rise. No, that's the end of the Christian religion. Is there any evidence that they ever produced the dead body of Jesus? No, they have a problem. The tomb is empty. They know the tomb is empty, and they have to come up with some kind of a theory to explain it away, but they never found the dead body of Jesus. So was, was the body stolen? No, because no one ever produced the body of it. What's the point in stealing the body if you don't produce the body to refute the Christian religion? So it's a ridiculous thing. How about this one? Let's do the swoon theory. Now, this is my favorite. This is a popular theory back in the 19th century. Uh, Islamic people believe it to this day. Okay? Jesus is a prophet, and God would not, Allah would not let his prophet die in a humiliating way like being crucified. So he didn't really die on the cross. He was given a drug, right? So what happens? He was given a drug, and then he looked like he was dead. And then what happened? Well, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus come along, and they pop the nails out, and they wrap them up in bandages, and they put them in the tomb. And when he was in the tomb, because it was so nice in there, he recovered. It's like a recovery room in a hospital. Now what did he do then? He got out of the mummy, the wrapping, right? And he rolled the stone away. How do you do that from the inside of a tomb and the stone weighs a ton and a half? I don't know. And then he appeared to the disciples over the next 40 days, at least 12 recorded times. Here, Thomas, stick your finger in my wound here. Yeah, you know, in the side, no problem at all. Do you want anybody touching your open wounds? You can look, but you can't touch. So how is it that he recovered? And think about this. When was the last time that Jesus ate? He ate the last supper on Monday, Thursday. It's now Sunday morning. What do you do with a person who experiences a trauma like Roman crucifixion? Did you watch the movie, The Passion of the Christ? Yeah. Guess what? It was worse than what he showed on the movie. He was scourged and beaten. 
Some people die of that. He was nailed to the cross after being compelled to carry it the long way through the streets of Jerusalem. And, ready? Was Jesus dead? How do you know? The blood separated. Yeah. In the Gospel of John, remember this? The Roman centurion stood there and they got orders from Pilate because the Jewish religious leaders said, we can't have these bodies hanging on the cross during Passover. So they murder you, but they don't want to break the law of having dead bodies hanging around town. Hypocrites. So they go to the one on the right, they go to the one on the left, and they break their legs. Why do they break their legs? So they can't walk. Suffocate. Yeah, here's what happens. When you're crucified, okay, you have to stand up on your feet in order to exhale and drop yourself down again in order to inhale. So they go like this. So there's a movement like this. Until what happens? Exhaustion. You get so tired of sweating and exhaustion and pain that you can't, you can't do this anymore and you suffocate. Your heart literally explodes within you. So you break the legs, and how long do they last? Wow. Oh, about a minute or two until they die. Mm -hmm. Well, they did the left, they did the, and guess what? They come to Jesus, what do they do now? They take a spear. And they stuck it to the side. Where? What side? What, where, what does it say, though? Under the fifth rib. Under the fifth rib. What does that mean? That's where the heart is. The Romans, when they kill people, they, they're trained to, by this. They have a gladius sword, and they stick you under the fifth rib. It's a direct line right to your heart. You, you, you don't get stuck. You don't get. You don't get stuck under the fifth rib and live to talk, tell about it. And what comes out of the wound? Blood. Blood and water. Blood and water comes out of the. John didn't know what he was saying. He just reported what he saw. We now know that when a person dies, the red blood cells separate out from the mm -hmm. white in a clear serum, and you end up with something that looks like blood and water coming out of the wound. In other words. Was he faking his death? No. If, if he couldn't stand up, if you don't move, he's given a drug, let's say, that made him look like he's dead. You can't stand up, you can't breathe, and you're going to suffocate, just like having your legs broken. In other words, was he really dead? Yeah, he was really, really dead. So the swoon theory, among these ridiculous things, the wrong tomb, stolen body, the swoon theory, right? So let's do another one. This one, this one is another ridiculous theory. Jesus had a twin brother, right? And do we know any twins in the New Testament? No. You yes. don't? Yes. Thomas, Thomas, what's his, Thomas Didymus. The word Thomas means twin. Didymus means twin, so his name is Twin Twin. So you're creative. Who's Thomas's twin brother? Jesus? Yeah, that's what people thought. Oh, please. So, when Jesus was crucified, it wasn't really Jesus, it was his twin brother that was crucified. Or some people have a spin on it and they'll say, oh no, it wasn't really Jesus, it was a substitute. It was Judas who was grabbed and he was crucified instead of Jesus. Why is that? You can't have Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. You have to undermine the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You can't have Jesus on the cross. You can't, nope, no, 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 can't have it, can't have it. So you're willing to take any ridiculous theory you can come up with to prevent him from being on the cross. Because his death on the cross saves us from our sins. Yeah. So the, the twin theory. Okay, so ready? One of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, we're going to talk about it in a couple of weeks here, maybe even next week. I don't know, I haven't looked ahead that far. They're in the upper room. What are the disciples doing in the upper room? They're hiding. Why are they hiding? Because they're afraid they're going to be killed. Therefore, there's no uh, stolen body theory. Doors are locked. Jesus appears to them and says, peace be to you. Why does he say that? He says, shalom. In other words, I don't know about you, but if Tony Soprano, if I abandoned him, and I found out Tony Soprano is back from the dead, I'd be worried because he's going to render justice on you. So when Jesus says, in other words, you're forgiven for running away. Mm -hmm. Who's not there? Thomas isn't Thomas. there. Why? Because Thomas and Jesus, I guess, are the same, the same person, right? He's the twin or something? No. The next week, Thomas is there. And what does Thomas do? He says, he falls down on his knees, 
And he says, my Lord and my God. Thomas, the twin, calls Jesus my Lord, my Yahweh, and my Theos, my God, my Lord and my God. Is the twin brother theory a viable theory? Yeah, if you don't read the Bible and don't, don't care about the facts, it's a viable theory. See? And I'll save the best one for last, the hallucination theory. Now, those of us who lived through the 60s are certainly familiar with this one, okay? The hallucination theory. Now, when you take LSD or some other thing like this, what happens? Steve, I don't mean to be talking about you personally here, but <laughs> Let, let's ask Steve what happens. No, we know what happens. It's a what? It's a Subjective experience. What does that mean? That means it's in your head, right? Yeah. So, okay, if somebody came along and said, I saw Jesus. I'd want to ask him more questions about that, right? But it could be a hallucination. There are a lot of crazy people running around New York pushing people in front of subways and stuff. They probably see Jesus all the time. Am I suspicious about their witness and testimony? Yes, I am. So if Mary Magdalene shows up, and who is she anyway? Mrs. Jesus. Isn't that interesting? They, 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 they tell you that she's married to Jesus, but they... They failed to mention that it doesn't say that in the Bible anywhere. They just make stuff up, in other words, right? So Mary Magdalene, you'd want to say to her, let me get this straight now. You went to the tomb, it was empty, and then you saw the gardener, and it turned out to be Jesus, and he said to you that, you know, he's risen and so on. Well, another account, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb with Mary, the mother of James, right? And Calop uh, the wife of Cleopas, right? And Joanna. So a group of women went and they saw the empty tomb and they met the risen Lord. Okay? Now, uh, let me talk about this for one second. Um, you, you're a lion skunk. You're going to make up a religion. Okay? Book of Mormon or something. You're going to make this up. So what do you do? You want to find strong, upstanding citizens like George Hunt here to be your, to be your witness. George, I had the gold plates that the Hill Camorra, I'm going to show you these gold plates and get his testimony written down. You don't go to the women in town and you say, what did you see? In other words, it's called the criterion of embarrassment. It's embarrassing that the women are the first ones at the tomb. Again, why the women's the first one at the tomb? Because the men are hiding in the upper room, they're afraid to go out. So the women go. And again, if you were going to make up a religion, you wouldn't have women be your lead witnesses. Right? In Jewish courts, uh, women witnesses are held in high, highly suspect. You need two Jewish men to give testimony. Right? So the idea that well, maybe Mary Magdalene had hallucinations, okay, along with all the other women? No. It's, hallucinations are subjective and individual, not a whole group of people. In our 1 Corinthians 15 text tonight, it says, Jesus appeared in front of 500 brothers and sisters. How many? 500. Is that an individual hallucination? No. So you're stuck, you know. He also appeared in the upper room to the, the tw they call them the 12, it's really 11, because yeah. Judas isn't there. He appeared to them twice, okay. He also appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. He appeared to his brother James, mm -hmm. right, okay. So the idea of a hallucination is not, you know, again, our religion is not based on visions or delusions or hallucinations or people with wild imaginations. So if there is no wrong tomb, if there is no stolen body, if there is no swoon theory, there is no twin brother, there is no hallucination, well then, what are you stuck with? Well, you're stuck with the truth, the truth which is what? The death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Now stop. What is the resurrection of Christ? What's the big whoop de do? Why do we care that it's true that Jesus rose from the dead? Here's why. First of all, the incarnation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The birth, the life of Christ. The deity of Christ. Now, it's one thing to say, this guy is God. Okay, well, that's your opinion. That's interesting, isn't it? That this is God? Okay, the deity of Christ? That's good. How do you know He was God? Okay, ready? Okay. The death of Christ. Was he really dead? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, he was really dead. We went through the whole proof thing, you know, the blood and water and so on. 
the resurrection. The tomb was empty, and there's no adequate way of explaining the empty tomb. There's no adequate way. What does the resurrection mean? Here's what it means. Vindication. He is what he said he was. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. He is God. So in other words, the resurrection feeds back this way, and it's proof of the deity of Christ. He's been vindicated. He is who he says he is. Why else is the resurrection important? It's the center of the Christian religion. What do you mean the center of Christian religion? Well, here, there's a couple of things. When we do a baptism, what do we do? The old time Baptists go down to the river, they chop a hole in the ice this time of the year, they take the person, you're dead, the old you is buried underwater, and you're raised up again. The death, the burial, and the resurrection, a new creature in Christ. We do baptism because we are replicating or imitating the most important event in the Christian religion, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. As Christ was baptized, you know, we too shall be baptized. As Christ rose from the dead, we too shall be raised from the dead. Baptism. How about this? In the name of which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. What is that? Bread and wine. It's the what? Body and blood of who? Christ. Body and blood of Christ. Do we celebrate Passover that started last night? No. Why not? Because Jesus has replaced the Passover. We don't slay 30,000 lambs in the temple on the day of preparation because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We don't do Passover. Instead, we have Holy Communion, which retains elements of the Passover Seder but we have the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, the real presence of Christ, where two or more are gathered in his name. The resurrection changed the way we think about God. And ultimately, what day is tomorrow anyway? I don't know what you mean. What day is tomorrow? Easter. Easter what? Sunday. Easter Sunday. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He dies on Good Friday. He's raised again on Easter Sunday. What's the big deal about Sunday? It's the seventh day of the week. It's also the number of new beginning, number eight. The seventh day and the eighth day, right? So why do we go to church on, on, on Sunday? Why do we do that? Because of the death, burial, resurrection, the resurrection of Christ. When you come to church on Sunday, it's 52 weeks out of the year. You're telling your neighbors... I believe that Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday morning mm -hmm. at the crack of dawn. We don't go to church on Saturday, right? No. Because the old Hebrew Sabbath is now passe. It's been trans... I know the Saturday night group. But when you come, it's three stars are clearly visible, so it's actually Sunday the next day. You're the first service of Sunday. <laughs> no, but, but tradition. So, so we... Literally, Sunday is a day where we celebrate a mini Easter. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the center of the Christian religion. Mm. That's what we do. We gather around. We don't say, we like the old dead guy hanging here. It's a tragic thing. He was a great philosopher and a teacher. Let's go visit the tomb where Jesus was and think about the dead guy. No, we don't. We celebrate, we look at this cross and we know what he suffered. We know that he actually died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. We celebrate, we commemorate the resurrection of this one. The empty cross. The empty cross. <laughs> That's what we do. Mm -hmm. The cross is empty, the tomb is empty, and Jesus rose from the dead. That's the meaning of Easter. Amen. Amen. Mm.